Hello and welcome to the first environmental science lecture. We're starting with chapter one. What you want to do is have your lecture notes that have been put on Schoology and, and you want to have those in front of you and fill them out as we go through because that will be what you'll use on tests, quizzes, etc. Feel free to pause the video at any time if I go too fast and you aren't able to fill things in. All right, so the world population is growing. Um, we're looking at, we're probably gonna be peaking sometime this century, but we're looking at being somewhere between nine to 11 billion, 9.6 to 11 billion people, um, you know, by the time we top out. So this of course has lots of consequences. So there's a few terms, sustainability, which is the ability of a system to survive um, over time, you know, to, and to survive and function over time, and then sustainable yield, the highest rate at which a potentially renewable resource can be used indefinitely without reducing its availability. So um, for fishing, say the sustainable yield would be how many fish you can harvest without reducing fish stocks over time. So the tragedy of the commons is an idea that's been around for a long time. Aristotle first noted something similar to it. Um, what is common to the greatest number has the least care bestowed upon it, but it really became famous with Garrett Hardin in 1968 in that the overuse of a common property open access resource that are owned by no one. So that's really important that they're open access owned by no one, but available to everyone free of charge. And so what happens is when you have a resource that's open to everyone, often that can get overused. So again, overfishing is a good example of that. Little side note, Garrett Hardin um, had some really uh, crazy ideas and he's been labeled as a white supremacist by the SPLC. You can, you can look him up if you're more interested in checking that one out. All right, so here are just some common examples of, of, of the tragedy of the commons. Um, Easter Island, not as common, but the uh, entire population of the island went extinct and they, they are still, still under, under debate as to why that happened. But some people think that because it was not a very big island that they overused their resources and were not able to survive. The Pacific Ocean garbage gyre, um, the, all the plastic in the ocean, again, the oceans are huge and no one owns them. And unfortunately, they become highly polluted. Air pollution, again, it's open access and traffic congestion. If the roads are open to everyone, um, then everyone overusing it could be considered a tragedy of the commons. All right, so let's look at a few examples and I'm gonna let you think about these and you might have to answer a question about them on Edpuzzle. But do you think each of these is the tragedy of the commons? So the first example, too many people withdraw water from an aquifer, which is an under, underground you know, water storage area, usually natural. Um, taking it faster than it can recharge and it runs dry. B, a rancher has many cows which end up overgrazing his land during a drought. Or C, the hooker chemical company dumped toxic chemicals into Love Canal. After they sold the property, these toxins poisoned residents who bought homes on the site. Um, that's a true story. We'll be learning about that one later this year. All right, so let's look at A. The answer is yes, it is the tragedy of the commons. It's an open access resource that too many users um, then end up depleting. The second one, no, um, because it's privately owned property, um, it is not a tragedy. It's a tragedy, but not a tragedy of the commons. And C, again, no, privately owned property, so not a tragedy of the commons. So again, remember that tragedy of the commons, it has to be specifically open access or public use resources. So the other two, while, while they were bad, um, were not examples of tragedy of the commons. All right, so population. Um, developed countries that are highly industrialized are called developed, and developing countries are ones that have low to moderate industrialization. And um, you know, population in the world is mostly increasing in developing nations, not the developed nations. In fact, a lot of developed nations are decreasing population. All right, and then if you look at resource use for developed versus developing, the developed nations use the lion's share of resources across the world. These numbers change a little bit over time. These are, I think these are the statistics from your textbook, but it, the overall picture hasn't changed. So while population is much greater in developing nations, the resource use is much greater in developed nations. All right, GDP, gross domestic product, value of all goods and services produced within a country within a year. These are just terms that you need to know. Per capita, so you're then looking at it as, as per person, how much wealth is in the country. 
and uh, the wealth gap. Um, since 1970, the, the gap in per capita GDP between rich, middle, and income and poor has widened. So you see a picture with U.S. families over there, but it's also been true across the, across the world that the income gap between the very wealthy nations and the poor nations has widened. In our country, you've probably have heard of this before, that the richest, sometimes you even talk about the 1%, but the, definitely the richest 10% have done much better than people on the lower rungs, which haven't really moved over the past several decades. All right, so there's this equation. Um, for environmental impact, and, and I'll go through the, what the, each of the letters mean. You can see the equation in the lower right corner. Uh, P is for population, number of people. A is for affluence, how, uh, what the per capita consumption is. And just note that poverty can lead to environmental degradation, but the wealth and resource consumption is, it's, it's outweighs what, um, what poverty does. And then T, technology, how much environmental deg degradation and pollution per unit of resource used. And so the more developed a nation, generally the more uh, resources they use for all of, their, all of their goods, technology, et cetera. So, and then I equals environmental impact, and you have this equation. So it's just one way to measure impact of different nations, et cetera. All right, so renewable resources. Um, or sorry, renewable and, sorry, I can't see the top of my screen because of the Zoom, the Zoom stuff. Um, perpetual resource is an inexhaustible uh, resource, like it'll never go away, so you don't need to worry about it. We have an unlimited supply of solar power, the geothermal energy from the center of the earth, and then wind and wave energy is actually driven by the sun also, so those are perpetual resources. Potentially renewable resources are ones that can be renewable, but if you use them too fast, you can deplete them. So things like wood, so forests, soil, um, groundwater, freshwater, air, all of those things will replenish themselves over time. We should say clean air, really. Um, but their replenishment rate can be slow, especially in, the, in terms of soil and groundwater. And so they're only potentially renewable because you have to watch that you don't exceed the sustainable yield for them. Non-renewable resources are just, um, they cannot be re replenished at a, at a reasonable rate. So, you know, all fossil fuels were mostly made millions of years ago when the earth was a lot warmer and wetter. Um, all metals, minerals, recycling, reusing does not make them renewable. They're still considered non-renewable resources. Those are pictures of mines in the lower two pictures. And it's amazing to me, um, for our copper supply, we have taken a whole mountain in Utah and completely turned it into a big hole in the ground um, to get the copper. All right, so recycling. You guys know what recycling is. There's two different types. There's closed loop where you basically take something and make it into the same thing again. So aluminum is an example of that. You can take aluminum cans and make them into new aluminum cans. Um, open loop or down cycling is where you take a product, recycle it, and make it into something new. Generally, that new thing is not going to be as high quality as, as the original product. So taking you know plastic bottles, turning it into a park bench, and uh, recycling is great, but we've recently, there's, there's a bunch of issues with it. Uh, some of these things have always been there, the public willingness to recycle. And um, people are much more willing to recycle if you have a single stream, meaning you can throw all of your, your glass, your paper, your plastic into one bin like the one you see at the top. If it's separated, like the second one you see, most people are not really willing to have those in their homes. It was hard enough to, to, make, to get my you know, 80 year old mom to recycle in a single stream thing. She grew up without recycling. She didn't like having all these bins for things. She now does single stream recycling, but I don't think I'd ever convince her to do the separated. But there's some problems with um, having the single stream recycling. Uh, the infrastructure to collect. So you have to have the recycle trucks that come by every week to collect your recycling or every other week in my case. And then you have to have a market for those recycled items. And this is where the biggest issues come up, um, happened. And that China, um, just a couple years ago, uh, put out a policy they called the National Sword Policy, and they banned the import of most plastics and other materials. And they banned it unless it could like really meet this very, very high standard for cleanliness. So the problem is when you have single stream recycling, your recycling materials are not gonna be clean. The dribbles from your soda containers are gonna dribble onto the paper and the plastic is maybe not washed out. And so basically all American recycling failed China's uh, new policy and they are now refusing our recycling. This has thrown our recycling you know, infrastructure in our country into a tailspin because we don't have other places to send it. So we started sending it to Malaysia and now they're starting to refuse it. So, you know, now 
we are recycling, we're still collecting it, but in a lot of cases, we don't have anywhere to send it. So cities are starting to burn it, which isn't good because it puts toxins into the air. We're now sending it to landfills, which would be the same as not recycling it at all. And we might actually do a little bit more investigation of this in class. Uh, there's some great articles out there that we might watch or we might read. All right, so pollution. Um, there you see what happens when you see the pictures of the, you know, the Pacific Ocean gyre and the, these places that are highly polluted with plastics, et cetera. Often that comes from countries like us. We, we, send, we ship it off to other countries, they, they can't handle it all, and then it ends up getting into waterways, et cetera. So pollution can be considered, there's everything from noise pollution to air pollution, water pollution. There's many different types. It's basically any undesirable change in our environment that can harm us or other organisms. So there's um, two different types when you're looking to classify where it comes from, and that is point source and non-point source. Point source pollution are pollutants from just a single easily identifiable source, meaning you can point to that sewage outfall pipe in the first picture that's in Florida and see the stuff coming out, or you can point to a smokestack coming off a factory or a coal plant and say that's where the pollution is coming from. Non-point source is a lot harder. You might say that plane is a point source, but once those pesticides are, or whatever it is it's, it's spewing behind it, is on the ground, things like pesticides, uh, fertilizers, which can be considered pollutants if they get into waterways, um, automobile exhaust, because these things are moving around, they're a lot harder to pinpoint exactly where it's coming from. So yes, each on a micro scale, each car tailpipe could be considered a point source, but together cars in general um, are non-point source because it moves around and you don't know exactly where the worst pollution is coming from. So think about which one of those is gonna be harder to address if you're trying to reduce pollution in your country. All right, so um, three different things affect um, the how toxic chemical pollution is going to be. And the first one is chemical nature, you know, which is pretty obvious. How harmful is it to living organisms? So that's going to depend on what type of chemical you have. But another thing to consider is, is it fat soluble? Fat soluble uh, toxins will accumulate in your fat cells in your body and can then bioaccumulate, which means as things go up the food chain, it can get stored in the fatty tissue. And so um, as the little creatures eat toxins, it can then get concentrated, say, into the small fish that eat that and then the bigger fish. And then by the time you get up to large organisms like orcas, they can have quite a lot of toxins accumulating in their fatty tissue. Concentration, so you know how much, how much of it is out there? And this is again gonna depend how much is toxic. It's gonna depend on every different chemical out there. So, um, so lead, what's interesting is that over time, we've actually revised, we keep revising downwards what concentration of lead we consider toxic. In the 1970s, lead was in our paints and it was in our gasoline and, and we didn't know it was that toxic. And then over time, we've realized that really any level of lead is pretty toxic. And so as far as what we consider a safe amount for someone to ingest has dropped over time. And then persistence, how long does it stay around? So if it's degradable, broken down pretty quickly, so you know things that are organic often do, if they're, if they're biodegradable, but non-degradable non uh, cannot be broken down. And one of the easy ways to tell if something's non-biodegradable is, is it an element? So a lot of our toxic metals, lead, mercury, arsenic, they're elements. You can't break them down. They're, they're they're, they're down as far as they can go um, unless you start splitting atoms or something. They're non-biodegradable. They're non-degradable. Um, and then plastics are also considered non-degradable because they can take hundreds to thousands of years to break down. So I put the little asterisk there because biodegradable plastics are becoming more common. But plastic in general, most of it non-degradable. All right. So um, when you look at the environmental impact, there's all different sources, and there you see the poverty one there. But also realize that. Um, you know, developed nations also have a big environmental impact. And then the one that's really um, not talked about a whole lot is the excluding environmental costs from market prices. That one uh, is that, you know, if you're, if you're having a lot of health costs because your factory is polluting right next door and there's a lot of people having to get asthma and get medical care because of that, that's an environmental cost that's not factored in. All right, so there's two different kinds of footprint. The one that we're gonna be looking at in class is called the ecological footprint. And that's the total amount of productive land, sea, et cetera, water that you use to produce all the goods that you use in your lifetime. So it's not just the house where you live and you gotta consider all the food you eat, all of your technology, 
those um, metals in your phones, et cetera? Where do those come from and how much land space does that take up? More specifically, there's also something called the carbon footprint, which is the amount of carbon dioxide emissions that result from activities of an individual. And so it's a little kind of more of a subset of your total ecological footprint. So again, there's lots of overlap between those two, um, but they're not quite the same thing. So here's just some examples of things that, you know, for the one on the left, it's how much water different, different vegetables and fruits use to produce. So if you're eating broccoli, it looks like that's a pretty water heavy thing, which, which kind of surprises me a little bit. Um, and then you can see the big carbon footprint of what you eat. And some of this um, will depend on not just how much water and land the resource takes, but how far is it being transported to get to you. So the upper right picture shows, it's a European picture just showing where are their, you know, pro, where, where's their produce and meat being produced. And if you have to transport that overseas, across oceans, long distances, um, that's going to increase your carbon footprint. So eating locally is a movement that's considered very environmentally friendly. All right, so, you know, for the U.S., we um, end up, we are, we're the biggest consumers on the planet. If you compare us to other countries, the average European uses only 4.5, about half of what we use. We use about nine global hectares, a hectare is 23 acres. And a lot of your developing nations use a lot less. So again, you, you'll be looking at this in class. All right, so this is interesting to me because I have a 1950s house and it holds two people and it's a little bigger than the one shown in the picture, but the size of the average American home has gone up over time. And this is also interesting to me because I grew up in a little cottage town, was considered a summer beach town for people living in Chicago and full of cute little houses. And now whenever I go back, those cute little houses have been torn down and replaced with huge, huge houses. And, and that bums me out because in order to do that, they had to, the, the town was very forested. A lot of those trees are gone now. So how is this gonna affect your ecological footprint if you're living in bigger houses instead of smaller houses? You know, you're, it's gonna take a lot more materials to build the house, a lot more materials to fill the house. And then yeah, you've lost your yard, your vegetated area. And that's what I've noticed in my hometown is that the, the woods are not nearly as thick as they used to be. And, you know, so how else will it affect your carbon footprint? Your heating and cooling costs are going to be gr much greater for a large house. And, you know, your yard size is going to be smaller. So again, you're, you're not going to be pulling as much carbon out of the atmosphere. All right, so how do we fix the problem then? Um, is for that equation that I put out there before, if you want to lower your impact, bringing population size down, lowering consumption per person. And then instead of, you know, being high impact, the stuff that you use, try to produce green materials rather than, um, rather than non-green materials. So the, the, the um, you know, green revolution, looking at using renewable energy sources, et cetera, is a way to maybe reduce your technology uh, resource use. All right, so this is the end of lecture one. I just wanted to end here. It's a figure from your book. Um, to be sustainable, you need all four of the factors there. Uh, reliance on solar energy, and remember that's not just solar power, but it's things like wind and water, biodiversity, nutrient cycling, and population control. So that is the end of lecture part one, and there is a lecture part two for chapter two coming up.